It is after 1985 when a careful observer of the Avalon Hill Game Company may have noticed the beginning of a decline. Things may have looked just fine on the surface, but there was a danger lurking deeper under the water. Here we will document the beginning of the end of Avalon Hill on Legendary Tactics. Outwardly, the board gaming hobby seemed fine. The General Magazine ran lists of the growing number of conventions, events, and clubs, even providing information on how to start your own. Origins 86 took place in Los Angeles over the 4th of July weekend that year, with Don Greenwood and Craig Taylor taking part. The General interviewed both Greenwood and Taylor that year. Greenwood, who had become very prominent at Avalon Hill over the years, shared in that interview that his favorite game was up front, the game he was most proud of was Advanced Squad Leader, and he detailed the thankless job of the board game developer. For his part, Taylor revealed a bit of his early life as an Air Force brat, who attended 11 schools in 12 years as a kid, and had such varied work experience as a manager of fast food restaurants, a buyer at a fast food company, and manager of a liquor store, before coming on staff at Avalon Hill as a full-time designer. After talking about his philosophy as a war game designer, as he strove to balance his games between playability, accessibility, and realism, he had some interesting thoughts on the state of the industry at that time. He felt that the industry was suffering from too much of a good thing. Compared to the early days of the hobby, it had never been easier to find things like miniatures, new games, and even opponents. However, therein lay the problem. The proliferation of games had, in his opinion, diluted the hobby so that people weren't playing the same games anymore, and therefore had no common language to speak to others about their experiences. Players were now specializing in any number of different genres like role-playing, computer games, board war games, monster games, play-by-mail games, miniatures war games, etc. While great for players, the challenge for publishers was in finding a large enough audience to financially justify the niche games they were making. In addition, board game conventions, once a rare occurrence, were now so common that people felt they could afford to miss them. The other long-term concern he expressed was the fact that those in the hobby were aging and expressed the need for some Dungeons & Dragons-like crossover hits that would attract more players, and preferably younger ones, to the hobby overall. 1986 had some great new Avalon Hill games, but there was a noticeable drop in the number of releases. After many years of high output, there were for example 13 new games released in 1983 alone. Only 6 new games came out that year. Platoon is a notably simple war game based on the very successful movie of the same name. The basic rules are contained on a single sheet of paper, and the advanced rules are comprised of a mere booklet. The complexity rating on the famous Avalon Hill complexity scale was a solid 3 out of 10. It is interesting for a couple of reasons. First, it uses standees, Stratego style, to create the effect of fog of war, where each unit might potentially be a group of soldiers, mines, booby traps, or nothing at all. It also borrowed from the game Firepower with its random initiative draw, although in the largest scenario in the game, this means that some units won't even have a chance to move at all before the end of the game. There are four scenarios, each of which recreate the battle scenes from the movie, but they are limited in scope using a single board for all the scenarios, with no variation. The game system was successful and useful enough, however, to be later implemented in Avalon Hill's Smithsonian series of games. Greed is a simple push-your-luck dice game. Players roll six dice with the individual letters of the word greed and a dollar sign on them, with the E's being of different colors. Each roll must score something, or all previously earned points are lost that turn. To further complicate things, the dice that are used to score are set aside, making scoring in future rolls a trickier affair. It's a simple game, likely designed to fill 15 minutes or so at the end of a long game night. Flight Leader, which in an earlier iteration had been known as Check 6, had been published previously by Close Simulations, and was designed by Phantom Jockey Captain Gary Morgan. It was originally intended for use by the US Air Force in training its fighter pilots. It is a game of jet-on-jet -jet conflict, where 2-8 to eight players choose from over 200 aircraft types out of orders of battle for air forces from 100 different countries in any decade from the 1950s to the 80s. The game seeks to recreate the situation of a modern dogfight in the air. Each turn represents 30 seconds, and everything a modern jet fighter pilot needs to take into consideration is here, from energy management to weapon systems, from terrain to altitude and formations, from radar lock-ons to pilot quality. 
It is highly respected for its realism by those who enjoy this type of game, but the realism does slow down the pace of the game a fair bit. On the plus side, the basic game has only four pages of rules, so it is easy to get started with it until the player wants to graduate to the advanced game, which fills the other 20 pages of the rulebook. Empires in Arms, first designed by Australian Design Group in 1983, was licensed to Avalon Hill for publication in 1985. It recreates the diplomatic, economic, and warfare elements of the Napoleonic era on a grand strategic scale from 1805 to 1815. Players can choose from a number of major nations to steer through this turbulent time, either Austria, France, Great Britain, Prussia, Russia, Spain, or Turkey. Alliances can be established and broken, conflict will be conducted on land and sea, peace treaties can be signed and broken, and conquered territory administered. The full game lasts an incredible 132 turns, and can take a full complement of 7 players anywhere from 100 to 300 hours to complete. It was selected as an entry in the 2007 book Hobby Games The 100 Best, which said that it is one of the longest, most complicated, and most demanding board games that has ever been produced. However, Empires in Arms is also the most exciting, engrossing, and rewarding board gaming experience. Games Magazine said it was in the top 100 games of that year, saying it is a vivid game of the Napoleonic Wars. While land and sea conflicts are important, diplomacy and economic decisions play crucial roles too. In 2007, a digital version of this game was published by Matrix Games. Armchair General said it was an easy recommendation for veterans of the board game and those who want to learn. Britannia, first published by Gibson's Games in 1986, was picked up and published by Avalon Hill the following year. It centers on the immigration to and the conflicts within the British Isles over many centuries, and includes many peoples like the Picts, Norsemen, Saxons, Angles, Romans, and Normans. The main scenario takes about four hours to complete, at the end of which players hope to be crowned King of England. Lewis Pulsifer created the game originally, under the working title Invasions. Gibson's Games published two slightly different versions in 1986, with development work done by Roger Hayworth without consultation with Pulsifer before it was published by Avalon Hill. Pulsifer regained the rights to Britannia in 2003 after a long break from working in the hobby, and announced an extensive revision. He hadn't paid attention to the game since he had originally conceived it, and was surprised at the ahistorical tactics that were allowed by the rules as they had been published. After cleaning up the rules and adding some new features, Fantasy Flight Games brought it back into print in 2005 as Britannia 2, and updated it again in 2008 after it sold out. It stayed in print with Fantasy Flight until 2012. Pulsifer brought it back again with PSC Games, adding some shorter variants and even including a two-player version. At this time, rumor has it that there is an epic version on the way at some point soon. It has always ranked very highly among gamers, proving to be a seminal work, inspiring numerous grand and epic games of civilization. 1830 Railways and Robber Barons was originally based on a design by Francis Tresham of Civilization fame. There is no luck in the game other than deciding the initial player order. Players buy and sell stock in different railway companies and operate any companies where they hold a majority share. Players make money with the stock market or by operating their railways well or by running them into the ground to extract the money from them. The player with the most money at the end of the game wins. Simtex made a digital version of the game in 1993, which apparently had a great AI opponent, although the game itself was judged as being extremely complicated by at least one video game reviewer. 1830 spawned a whole series of games, now known as 18XX. It was republished in 2011 by a partnership between Mayfair Games and Lookout Games. Paratrooper, though it was the second module for Advanced Squad Leader, was launched as a modestly sized follow-up. It uses four of the boards from Squad Leader, as well as one of its own to stage eight great scenarios based on the June 5, 1944 paratroop drops by the Allies in advance of D-Day. It was an affordable and fun introduction to ASL, squarely aimed at players of the original Squad Leader, who had yet to make the leap to the larger game. 1987 brought with it only seven new games. The Origins Convention, nicknamed the National Adventure Gaming Convention in the general, was held that year in Baltimore once more, over the July 4th weekend. 
Sadly, Mick Yule left Avalon Hill's employ that year to pursue a degree in computer science at the University of Maryland. The general magazine was as healthy as ever though, with each issue being more than 50 pages long, much of it dense text. The cost was soon to increase the following year, however. $15 for a one-year subscription, $24 for two years, and a newsstand price of $4. Dinosaurs of the Lost World is an unusual game by Avalon Hill standards. It is generally aimed at younger players, but there is enough meat on these bones for more seasoned gamers. Players lead expeditions into the Lost World, a land created in a novel by none other than Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who also penned The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The players roll dice to move along a track that allocates movement points, as well as causes events to happen, tools to be found, and dinosaurs to be moved, among other things. Players explore the map of the Lost World, occasionally having to battle the aforementioned dinosaurs and other hazards, or even other expeditions. When players find an adventure token, they move to the matching adventure chart, where they try to make it to the end of the adventure where all the goodies are, with die rolls or experience cards. The winner is the first player to both reach 25 victory points and escape the plateau. While not the best game ever made, it is considered to be a pleasant pastime. The theme is great, and the only letdown are the components, which are generally quite subpar. Yanks is the third module of Advanced Squad Leader, introducing the Americans. It was expensive and required the use of boards from Squad Leader as well as some of its expansions, but it contained a lot of fun scenarios. There were rules added for night fighting, amphibious landings, gliders, boats, and swimming, among many others. The counters reflected the troops that fought in Europe and North Africa, but not in the Pacific. That would come later. Partisan is the fourth module for Advanced Squad Leader, which came out in 1987 as well. It also needs boards from Squad Leader and Beyond Valor, in addition to the two boards it includes, and it focuses on the European resistance fighters and Russian Partisan irregular troops. This module gave a very different feel to ASL. There are no big fire groups pounding away at each other in rubble. Stealth and close combat are the order of the day, supported by light machine guns and Molotov cocktails. It is apparently quite fun with some amazing scenarios. TV Wars pits players against each other as heads of television networks, desperately filling their primetime schedules in an attempt to dominate the ratings wars. Star actors, Academy Award winning movies and reviewers all play a part. The game itself is a familiar roll and move game around a board, where players land on events and spaces which start bidding wars for programming. The humor of the game is questionable at times, with jokey show and movie names like The B Team and Star Warts, populated with caricatures like Larry Hangman and Flirt Reynolds, but the game is, for what it is, long and quite fun, though virtually forgotten today. Thunder at Casino uses the same area impulse system as Storm over Arnhem. It depicts the third battle that occurred at Monte Cassino between the 15th and the 23rd of March, 1944, and includes a couple of introductory scenarios, an end of battle scenario, and the full scenario that recreates the whole battle. Designer Courtney Allen added in some additional chrome to help the series evolve, such as terrain effects modifiers, rubble, and modified machine gun rules so that they can hinder enemy movement. Though it is well respected, it is seen as inferior to Storm Over Arnhem and the subsequent games that use the same system. The components are not as good, the map board has its detractors, and the counters are small and hard to read. Raid on Saint Nazaire depicts the Brazen Raid by British commandos on the port of the same name. While distracting the Germans with an air raid, a flotilla of ships attempted to mount an attack on the harbour. A crazed and bloody firefight ensued, which the game attempts to recreate. This is a solitaire game that has a lot of great ideas, and is quite well liked and respected. Especially notable is the opposing AI, a system which initially reflects the disorganization of the German response to the raid and the gradual escalation of the defensive response. There is a lot of die rolling though, and a lot of cardboard units will perish. To do well at this game is quite hard. Patton's Best, which was known as Hell on Wheels while in development, is another solitaire game. This time it puts players in an M4 Sherman tank, part of General George Patton's 4th Armored Division, as it speeds across Europe in 1944. The map is abstract, but basically represents the terrain of Normandy in France. On the board is a schematic of a tank, and players designate the actions and track the status of each individual crew member. 
Victory is obtained by capturing territory and destroying the enemy, as one might expect. It's an incredibly detailed, immersive game that really shines as a campaign game, where players can see their men develop in skill and become more effective as a team. Although when one loses an experienced man, it can be tough. The systems are a bit clunky by today's standards, and the game can get quite repetitive, but it is an interesting game with some good ideas. Knights of the Air was known as Knights of the Sky while in development, and is a game that depicts in great detail the dogfights of World War I. A wide range of airplanes of the period are here, and players get the chance to fly them by controlling the speed with the throttle, the altitude with the control stick, and the maneuvers with a deck of cards. It aims to have a great balance between playability and accuracy. There are solitaire scenarios that pit you against observation balloons or even a zeppelin. Overall, the game never rose out of obscurity, although it is a genuinely interesting game system. The aesthetics, at least for the time, were good, and it was a bit unique in that it covered the planes of World War I, which hadn't been done by the company since Richtofen's War back in 1972. The mechanics were a bit fiddly but solid once you had the hang of them. It was a fun challenge to both fly and shoot down your enemy at the same time, and it, in many ways, deserved more attention than it ultimately got. Also, there was another deluxe advanced squad leader module called Hedgerow Hell released that year, which depicted the battles between the American and German forces in the Hedgerows of Normandy. It comes with four boards with giant hexes for ease of play or for incorporating miniatures, some new counters, and eight scenarios. It was well received, but seems in retrospect to have been mostly overlooked. 1988 brought six more new games, and they were extremely varied. The General Magazine turned 25 years old, which was officially celebrated with the expansion to 64 pages. The original first issue, which came out on May 1st, 1964, had only been 12 pages long when a one-year subscription was $4.98. With the extra space, there were some new features added. Bill Peschel, the development head of the Micro Computer Games division at Avalon Hill, started a column called Computer Corner, in which articles about the design and play of Avalon Hill's computer game division were given space. And, as a replacement for the spin-off magazine All-Star Replay, fans of the company's sports games were given Sports Special, written by Jim Burnett. There was also a feature in the first issue of Volume 25 of The General, where different contributors over the years shared their thoughts on the previous quarter century of the magazine. There were some interesting revelations here. For example, Tom Shaw confessed that while Charles Roberts initially proposed the idea of having a magazine to feature Avalon Hill's games, no one could remember who had originally thought of the name The General. The special feature also included some ramblings from Don Greenwood, Rex Martin, Jim Dunnigan, Craig Taylor, and others who had contributed over the years to the success of The General and of Avalon Hill. Gettysburg 88 was timely, being released on the 125th anniversary of the Civil War battle it is based on. Although it is technically yet another treatment of the history that Avalon Hill had tackled many times before, this one is quite different and unique from its predecessors, and the basic rules became a template for the Smithsonian line of games, which updated other older Avalon Hill classics and came out in the early 90s. The main difference with the system is that this game didn't come with a combat results table, instead relying on competing rolls of 10-sided dice and adding combat strengths and modifiers. The scope of the difference between the two values determines the results of combat. The Confederate forces here are powerful but brittle, while the Union by contrast has scores of weak units. It sets up an interesting situation as both forces vie for control of key parts of the map while trying to avoid taking too many losses. As a game, this can be categorized as an introductory war game, and Avalon Hill described it at the time as a beer and pretzels game that doesn't represent the history especially well, but it is fun and fulfills its intended purpose. Enemy in Sight was also released that year. It is a card game for 2-8 to eight players that is set in the Age of Sail, where players take turns trying to sink each other's fleets. Designer Neil Schlaffer had originally titled the game Cutthroats and Cannons. The game is outwardly quite simple, as it is comprised of just two decks of cards. One deck is the deck of ships, which vary in quality from first rate to sixth, and an action deck which allows players to either attack the enemy or defend against them. 
The critics were mostly positive in their commentary on the game. In Games International Magazine of October 1988, Brian Walker gave the game a 4 out of 5 rating, saying that it is great fun to play, especially with a large group of people who have a penchant for churlish acts of revenge. However, in August of 1989, in issue 34 of Games Games Games, Paul Evans reported that he found he disliked the unexpected complexity, finding that the added complication detracts more from the flow of the game than it adds to my enjoyment of it. TAC Air got its start in the 1980s when the research and studies for the Office of Net Assessment at the U.S. Department of Defense created some war games to be used as training for the armed forces. Some of these games were later sold to game companies for commercial publication. TAC Air was one of these. Originally known as Forward Edge of Battle Area, or FIBA, it was a game that assumed the Cold War in Europe had gone hot and that the Warsaw Pact forces are invading West Germany. The scrappy NATO side has to try and hold them back with some ground units and tactical air support. Over 13 scenarios, battles take place to simulate this hypothetical situation, using 500 counters to represent the military forces involved. It is generally viewed as a fun but flawed game. Ellis Simpson rated it 3.5 out of 5, saying that Tac Air may be something of a missed opportunity in the realism stakes, but it is a good game. Spices of the World is a game that was a promotional item for a spice company from Baltimore, the McCormick Spice Company. The pieces are cylinders full of actual spices, and players use them to run around the world to collect the spices they need to win. The action happens on a large mounted board that depicts the trading routes historically used for the spice trade. Players start in Baltimore, and essentially have to pick up and deliver spices wherever the game guides them. It is, unfortunately, a completely luck-based game of rolling and moving the number of spaces indicated by the roll of the die. Landing on a dot causes an event card to be drawn, which causes a player to miss a turn or use an extra die in their next roll. There is no player interaction unless one player lands on another's space by exact roll, in which case they can steal a spice cargo from the other player. When one player earns enough spice points, they win. It is essentially an exercise in rolling dice, but to their credit, each spice card has a recipe on it which could be tasty, and it does attempt to educate players a little bit about the spice trade, which is an important part of history. Past Lives is a roll and move party game with a bit of an odd theme. Players are trying to figure out who they were in their past lives, and this is done by, unexpectedly, amassing as much wealth as one can. Based on a player's level, they get a past life assigned to them, which is revealed first by description, so people can try to guess who they were while it is being read aloud at the end of the game. It is very luck-based, but fun with the right crowd of casual gamers. Merchant of Venus, whose title is a pun on Shakespeare's famous play Merchant of Venice, is set at a time where a galaxy is reawakening in an unexplored region. Players are traders, moving around the board, exploring, buying and selling, picking up and delivering goods. It plays 1-6 to six players, though the solo game is a bit of a different game and much more focused on combat. First players must explore the region, discovering the different planets and cultures with whom to trade, and then players trade goods, building factories and ports that allow them to collect a commission when others use them. In the longer games, extensive trade routes will develop over the course of play. Mike Siggins in Games International Magazine gave it 4 stars out of 5, saying that Richard Hamblin has devised a system that has some clever design tricks, works within a reasonable time, has plenty of options, and offers high playability and balance. With the possible exception of SPI's out-of-print Star Trader, I would say it is the best trading game so far. John O'Neill said in Blackgate, Unlike Avalon Hill's other science fiction games like Stellar Conquest and Alpha Omega, the focus of Merchant of Venus wasn't crushing your opponents with massive fleets of warships. The game has remained popular, and reprinting it became contentious. On October 24, 2011, Stronghold Games announced that it had reached an agreement with designer Richard Hamblin to reprint the game for a 2012 release. Later that exact same day, Fantasy Flight Games announced that it had acquired the right to republish the game from Hasbro, which had acquired the rights to the game via their purchase of Avalon Hill. Both companies dug in, and though outwardly cordial, they each asserted their intentions to reprint it. However, by June 2012 an agreement was reached and in November of that year Fantasy Flight released the second edition, with Stronghold Games acting as consultant on the project. It contained two versions, the original as it was, and an updated version that is intended to appeal to contemporary gamers. 
Avalon Hill's Kremlin is actually a second edition, the first having been published in German in 1986 by Fata Morgana Spiel. It is a classic game about Russian politics with tongue held firmly in cheek. Players secretly place influence on different fictional politicians, each of whom have unique stats and age, and work to get them to become head of state and perform the ceremonial wave at the annual October parade. Along the way, these politicians age, get sent to Siberia, become victims of ill health, or even pass away. Once a player has a politician under their influence wave at the parade three times, that player wins. The original version of this game required funeral speeches to be given by players at the death of any of the cardboard party chairmen, and even vodka to be consumed at certain points. Avalon Hill's version is more of a serious game and less satirical than the original. It was included in the 2007 book Hobby Games The 100 Best. In Games International, Brian Walker thought the rules and components were excellent and rated it 5 out of 5, saying, it is difficult to determine the skill-luck ratio in this strange game, but who cares? The important thing is that it is such fun to play. In the December 1993 issue of Dragon, Alan Varney said that the game makes for backbiting, double-crossing fun, and Avalon Hill's advanced rules work well. Kremlin even got an expansion in 1989, which added cards depicting the real people and events from the beginning of the Soviet Union. Jolly Rogers Games released both a third and a limited edition in 2014, which also included a new modern scenario, as well as including the original Fata Morgana Spiel version and the Avalon Hill version, both with modifications. There were also two modules released for Advanced Squad Leader, called West of Alamine and The Last Hurrah. Each module added eight scenarios. West of Alamine added the British, focusing on the battles of North Africa between 1941 and 1943. Included were rules to reflect the desert terrain and climate, and five map boards of featureless terrain to which players could add overlays to create the fields of battle. The Last Hurrah deals with the Blitzkrieg campaigns that the Germans waged against the minor neutral powers like Greece, Norway, and Poland in the early days of World War II. It only contained two boards and a third was added in the second edition. In 1989, there were only five new games and an expansion that came out. The Origins Convention was held in Los Angeles that year. Turning Point Stalingrad puts players in the middle of the desperate Battle of Stalingrad, which ended up being one of the turning points of World War II. It is played at the battalion level, with each inch on the board representing about 500 meters. It uses the impulse system first introduced in Storm over Arnhem, where each day has a variable number of day and night phases. Tough decisions abound. Do you advance, attack with your panzers, send in dive bombers to disrupt the enemy's ferry landings? The map board constructed from reconnaissance photos is quite striking, and combat is handled in a unique way, where the attacking side can only be spent and unusable for a period of time, while the defenders can be spent, forced to retreat, or eliminated. While this seems to favor the attacker, being spent for up to four turns can mean trouble, if only because of potential missed opportunities. It is a bit lengthy at about four to five hours, and the game with the standard setup substantially favors the German side, but it is an exciting game that is easy to learn and that plays smoothly. It was also considered to be more tournament appropriate compared to, say, Thunder at Casino, which uses the same basic game system. Ellis Simpson reviewed Turning Point Stalingrad for Games International magazine and gave it five stars out of five, stating that, Of the year's wargame releases, this is my favorite and deserves to be yours too. Each playing is different, each turn within a game is different, and no two games are ever going to be the same. MBT is a military acronym that means Main Battle Tank. The Avalon Hill game of the same name attempts to simulate what World War III would have looked like between NATO and Warsaw Pact forces in Western Europe. It is at a small scale, with turns representing anywhere from 1 to 5 minutes, and hexes representing 100 meters. All the expected troops, vehicles, and ordnance are here, along with the modern gadgets and weapons of the time. The combat is very detailed. It is not unusual to be determining, say, the effects of a Leopard 2 shooting an armor-piercing round at the front-slash-side aspect of an advancing T-72. In fact, that is arguably the heart of the game. Norman Smith in Games International magazine rated MBT 4 out of 5, stating that MBT should be well-received by those whose prime interest is with modern tactical games. Miniature players should also take a look at this game. Pierre Grumberg said in Jeu et Stratégie 
that the level of detail is pushed to the extreme, a little too much for beginners, but that if the complexity doesn't put you off, and if you have time to learn the game, you will certainly like it. GMT Games published a second edition in 2016, and Rick Martin from Armchair General rated it 99%, saying that there is an incredible amount of research to make sure that all aspects of the weapons and situations are covered with exquisite detail. It is an instant classic. Napoleon's Battles are essentially traditional rules for 15mm miniatures gameplay, with basic, advanced, and optional rules. It covers everything from weather, to command control, to charges and pursuit, to hidden movement and generals. Combat is resolved in a similar way to Gettysburg 88 and the later Smithsonian series. While the game system provided could be a decent but fiddly method of playing out Napoleonic combat with miniatures, what comes in the box is only enough material to play the first two introductory scenarios. Mike Siggins of Games International Magazine gave the game a 5 out of 10, and said that quantity cannot replace quality, and at the end of the day this is no more than a decidedly average set of miniatures rules with a few smart counters thrown in. Blind Justice is a game of litigation, where the box claims that you will enjoy hours of hilarious and educational entertainment. Players move around the board with die rolls, either paying or collecting various small penalties and rewards, and eventually taking sides in one of 168 condensed versions of actual civil court cases, representing either the plaintiffs or the defendants. After that, the prosecution must make their case with a combination of spirited oratory and the facts of the situation, and the other players must then decide how much to award in damages. If the prosecution disagrees and decides to appeal, the real verdict of the case is referenced to decide what, if anything, the plaintiff receives. As players win cases, they rack up money, and the first to three million, or another number chosen beforehand, wins. It's a fun party game which will last an hour and a half to two hours, which might be a bit long for what it is. Hollow Legions, the seventh advanced squad leader module, added the Italian army to the mix, with another eight scenarios that allowed players to recreate battles in both North Africa and in Europe. It also added two new boards and three sheets of counters. Siege of Jerusalem is an intriguing game reminiscent of the earlier Caesar epic battle of Elysia. The Roman army, led by Cestius Gallus, with all of its weaponry and skill, are attacking Jerusalem, which is defended by a ragtag group of defenders whose main strength lies in the stout walls of the city. The Romans have a tight timeline to meet, and the Jewish forces have many ways to win. There is a wide range of unit types to utilize. Infantry, cavalry, siege towers, battering rams, catapults, onagers, zealots and leaders, among others. While there are some questions with regard to balance and the rulebook is poorly written, players love the map board and the quality of the components, and the historical situation is interesting to play out. It does take a lot of commitment, however, with the time on the box listed at 5 hours, but reviews like Canadian Wargamers Journal claimed playtimes ranged between 40 and 80 hours, even while saying the Avalon Hill 3rd edition is one of the most beautiful, detailed, challenging wargames ever made. The game was first published by Historical Perspectives in 1976 and got a second edition in 1980. Avalon Hill subsequently acquired the game and published the third edition with changes to the rules. The Chicago Tribune, among others, was pleased. Siege of Jerusalem is, however, one of the best games available on ancient warfare. It is moderately suited for solitaire play and easily adapted for teams. Charles Vasey was more lukewarm. He rated it either a 4 out of 10 or an 8 out of 10, depending on your tolerance for long and detailed games which take up a lot of table space. A new decade began in 1990 and there were signs of some dissent in the community. Certainly in the general there were reports of a bunch of crusty old wargamers complaining that Avalon Hill was moving away from their traditional historical wargame roots. Even the general dared to print articles on games that were not simulations like Enemy in Sight. New game releases like Dinosaurs of the Lost World, Blind Justice, Merchant of Venus, and Spices of the World were cited as further evidence of this trend. As it happened many times in the past, the current editor of the general took to the Avalon Hill philosophy section to defend the periodical and the company. Anytime the editor at the general got his hackles up in response to criticism, it always made for interesting reading. 
The next game did nothing to assuage the fears of the old guard. Wrestling is Avalon Hill's foray into professional wrestling to capitalize on the popularity of the sport in the 1980s. Players can take one of 24 different characters with different abilities in things like strength, skill, and recovery, and play various hold cards to try and force their opponent to submit. The system is fast, fun, and quick playing, and is flexible enough to allow both one-on-one -on -one bouts, tag team matches, or even battles royale. The Wedding Game is a game whose details have apparently dissipated into the sands of time, which sounds a bit funny for something that was published in 1990. It could be referring to a game of the same name that was originally published in 1870 and that might have been refurbished by Avalon Hill, but it is difficult to tell as there is little information available. Republic of Rome is a popular favorite that puts 1-6 to six players into the nasty snake pit of political intrigue that was the Senate during the Roman Empire. Players lead factions vying for control, attempting to become emperor, and trying to keep Rome's empire alive at the same time, balancing all the varied political, economic, and military factors. Plagues, assassins, wars, famine, unrest, and even bankruptcy are all here. But central to the game is the political intrigue and maneuvering that conveys a sense of the history and creates a compelling narrative. It is an intricate game with lots of options, but with commensurate flavor. It is considered to be a masterpiece by many. A Canadian company, Valley Games, now owns the rights to Republic of Rome and released their own version in 2009 to negative reviews. It had apparently undergone some controversial rules changes and there were errors in the rules and components that would greatly affect play. New World was a new take on the older Avalon Hill title called Conquistador, maintaining its unpleasant themes of discovery, colonization, exploitation, and conquest. Players take the role of one of six identical colonial powers, and victory is achieved by gaining control of five regions of the New World, or by having the most amount of gold by the end of a certain number of turns. While it was billed as a simple strategy game, the game time is approximately one hour per player, which might be a bit long for someone looking for a so-called simple strategy game. Derek Carver, who designed the game, was looking for a cleaner and more playable version of Conquistador, and he mainly succeeded, although the game is tough, much as life was in those days. There are a lot of bad consequences attached to negative die rolls in the game. Also, players will find themselves battling the environment more than the other players, and one will have to be okay with the fact that many settlers and soldiers will simply die of a variety of causes, weather, conflict, storms at sea, and the like. As to whether it is a better game than Conquistador, it seems to be a matter of taste. There is not much information online about the game called Pursuit of Insolvency, which apparently was released at the International Toy Fair that year. There is a news release announcing this game, but it seems as though this was just a joke, as the game purports to be about players taking on the role of owner of a board game company, with the winner to be the first player to take on $500 billion in debt. Showbiz is a game with an interesting premise rather clumsily executed. Players are theatre managers and must hire performers via auction for certain contract lengths, hoping they will appeal to the public's tastes both now and down the road, bringing in the most money. Players know what style of performer is popular at the moment, but not in the future, which makes things feel quite random. The game was originally published by the designer in and around 1984. Hexa Games published a German edition in 1988, which is the only version which handles up to eight players. Avalon Hill published their edition only with very minor changes. In 1991, there was an interesting article published in the General Magazine, which detailed a challenge gaming, and wargaming in particular, was facing. The so-called greying of the hobby was a real concern at that time. It is summed up in the first paragraph, and bemoans that, Recently, there has been much lamenting the fate of the hobby as we know it. Manufacturers have come and gone with increasing rapidity, and the incursions of computer-slash-video technology and fantasy role-playing has disturbed many a traditional wargamer. Here is one of the first overt mentions of the new challenger to the tabletop hobby, video games. This same article points out the differences between the generations at that time. And as for the next generation, they've taken the easy road. Plug it in and turn it on. Ever try to get a kid to read a rule book when there was a Nintendo set around? The graying of the hobby is not just a cute phrase, but an accurate description of what has happened to the wargame market. The younger generation simply has not embraced sophisticated board games with the same enthusiasm as their fathers. If it hasn't got bells and whistles, or if you have to read more than two paragraphs, forget it. 
Another issue was that Origins was no longer under the company's control, which meant that other interests began to steer the content and events. The proposed solution was AvalonCon, which was held in late August of 1991. It was billed as a return to the roots of the hobby when Origins was primarily a convention dedicated to historical wargaming. For $20 for pre-ordered tickets or $25 at the door, you could get in for three full days of gaming. No exhibit booths or seminars, just playing games together. Bringing along an interested youngster was also encouraged. Overall, 1991, surprisingly, was a bit of a return to form, as there were a bunch of new games. Well, that's not quite true. There were a lot of older games that were updated with new mechanics, some of which used the system first utilized in Gettysburg 88. The first was Battle of the Bulge. This was the third war game of this famous battle that Avalon Hill published after the versions released in 1965 and 1981. It is part of the Smithsonian American History series, which was meant by designer S. Craig Taylor as an introductory game to introduce new people to this fascinating hobby by providing smaller, simpler, faster playing, yet still challenging strategy games. It has three scenarios, of which the last one is the full campaign. It is a game that, although fairly simple, takes a long time to play. The first scenario, which covers the initial breakthrough by the Germans, reportedly takes as long as four hours. Also, the game's basic rules are arguably too simple. The optional rules are necessary to add any sort of historic flavor to the game. In Dragon Magazine, Doug Niles found that he liked Battle of the Bulge for its easily accessible game system, the high quality of the components, and the clear victory conditions. He found the game tilted towards the Germans in the shorter scenarios, but evened out in the longer ones. He said that, This is a great game for someone who wants to try a war game for a change of pace. However, the optional rules and lively game system make for a lot of replay enjoyment, even for experienced war gamers. It does a good job of covering its topic in an interesting and easily playable fashion. Midway's Smithsonian edition is based on the 1964 classic game that recreates the famous and pivotal carrier battle of World War II, but introduces some new concepts like an alphanumeric scale for defense and surface attack values, and things like torpedoes. As an attempt at an introductory war game, players can get started with a single sheet of rules, although the optional rules add a decent amount of depth. The components are quite nice as well, and the game was well received. Bill Thompson, for example, wrote in Wargame Academy that this new edition of Midway's greatest strength is its simplicity and is ideal for introducing wargaming to new players, but that despite the up-to-date graphics, the standardized rulebook format, and inclusion of much historical material as a modern-day introductory game, it seems more complex and not an actual improvement over the original. It was released to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. D-Day is another of the Smithsonian series remakes, based on the games of the same name released in 1961 and 1977. As before, it centers not so much on the actual landing on the beaches of Normandy, but rather on the campaign that followed to get across France to Germany. It has both an historical scenario and a what-if scenario that gives players the opportunity to play out the history completely differently. Richard Berg, in his review, noted that the map board is designed in such a way as 40% of the board would likely never be used, as it covers territory all the way to Vienna, when the Allies only need to cross the Rhine to win. He said that this is not a game that will appeal very greatly to regular gamers, for whom it will not be enough, or to the classicists, for whom the changes will be too much. Overall, the remake looks nicer, but isn't as interesting or accessible as the original, and will never be a classic. Attack Sub is a fast and furious two-player card game that, using Upfront as inspiration, tried to portray the cat-and-mouse battle between submarines and the surface ships trying to find and sink each other. Each player will have a combination of both, and will play cards trying to increase the contact level with the opponent's forces. The better the contact level, the more easily attacks can be directed against the enemy. The game is quite simple, without a lot of chrome, and plays quickly. However, it is not a game with a lot of depth, and can get repetitive after multiple plays. Also, it can be quite luck-based as well, so it may not be to everyone's taste. Candidate is an incredibly unrealistic game all about getting nominated for the presidency. To do so, players must win the various primaries by playing money or scandal cards into contested states and trying to outmaneuver and outguess their opponents. There is a lot of luck to the cards you draw, and bluffing is a big part of the game, so it will appeal to players who like that sort of thing. It is more complicated than it really needs to be, but it can still be fun. 
Mustangs is a game that recreates World War II dogfights using an impulse system, where faster planes get to move and do more in a given round. It is meant to be fast and furious, with little rules overhead. There are only two pages of rules and only five airborne maneuvers possible, including simply flying straight. If you can get an enemy within your sights, you both roll some dice and see what happens. It is a relatively simple game which plays relatively quickly, although optional rules for fuel and ammo limits, critical hits and pilot quality are included for those who wish for some improved realism. Tales from the Floating Vagabond is a sci-fi role-playing game whose light-hearted nature came with the tagline, ludicrous adventure in a universe whose natural laws are out to lunch. The Floating Vagabond of the title is a bar in outer space where game masters are recommended to begin each adventure. Players can make characters from different races including elves, disgustingly cute furry things, dogmen, and even humans. They can also learn skills like look good at all times and projectile vomiting, develop shticks that give each character distinctive abilities, and consume dangerous toxic beverages containing ingredients such as a singularity. The rules are quite flexible, allowing players to create new races or superheroes from any genre or world one can imagine. Rick Swan in Dragon Magazine said that the game generated more groans than belly laughs, not a good sign from an RPG that lives and dies on the strength of its jokes. After Avalon Hill went under, Lee Garvin released the game in PDF format and was working on a second edition when he passed away in 2019. In the difficult to pronounce and remember Adele Verpflichtet, later republished as Hoity Toity, players are rich snobs that are buying and stealing junk from each other using a modified paper rock scissors mechanic to see who can build the largest and oldest collection. The game is, somewhat surprisingly, highly regarded for its simple yet nuanced gameplay that allows it to be simultaneously a fun bluffing game and a great introduction to the hobby. It is regarded as one of the first Euro games, not in terms of the gameplay but in the fact it was an early import from Europe and offered a different style of game from what was generally being played in North America. Code of Bushido, the eighth module for Advanced Squad Leader, was eagerly anticipated as it introduced the Japanese to the game system. It added rules around the fanatical nature of the Japanese fighters, as well as new terrain like jungle, rice paddy, and bamboo. Four new map boards and four sheets of overlays allow players to create an endless variety of battlegrounds. Legends of Robin Hood is a simple and surprisingly fun game that transports players to Sherwood Forest once again to steal from the rich and give to the poor, taking on the roles of Robin Hood, Friar Tuck, Little John, and others. This is a card-driven game where players can play one card of each color per turn. Blue cards provide movement, green provides aid, black cards give the player the opportunity to rob or recruit, and red cards are used to hinder other players. The game is over after two reshuffles per player, and whoever has the most gold at that time wins. Advanced Civilization is an expansion for the original Civilization game that had proved to be a massive and influential hit. It enhanced the original game as much as it expanded it by simplifying trading, not limiting Civilization cards, and changing the archaeological succession table to be less harsh. It also added more Calamity, Civilization, and Commodity cards, and given that it takes a long time to play, added rules to allow for people coming and going mid-game. A computer version of Advanced Civilization was published by Avalon Hill in 1995. Computer Gaming World's Bob Proctor wrote, This game is perfect for those who play the board game, or for those who don't mind long, involving strategy play. However, the computer game proved to be unsuccessful, selling only 20,000 units in the following three years. Blackbeard attempts to recreate the golden age of piracy at the turn of the 18th century. Players control one or more pirates trying to plunder as many merchant and treasure ships as possible and retire before the king's commissioner, fellow pirates, or warships track them down. The game has players switching between acting as pirates or as the warships trying to catch them, and all of it is driven by a deck of cards that serves multiple purposes in the game. There are a lot of options to choose from, and players may choose to pirate in any way that suits them. This is a tactical game where players respond to the whims of Lady Luck, and not strategic where players work some grand overall plan. But it does what it sets out to do, which is to give people a game of moderate complexity where they can indulge their urge to yell "R" and experience something reminiscent of what life as a pirate was like back in the day. It is said that playing either solo or two-player is best, as it minimizes downtime for the players and balances out the luck involved. 
GMT released a second edition of the game called Blackbeard The Golden Age of Piracy in 2008, which incorporated many rules changes and seems to be more divisive in its reception. Around this time, another article in the General expressed the feeling of unease at the changing times. In Avalon Hill Philosophy, Part 139 in Volume 27, Number 1, an article by Chris Crawford, which highlighted areas of concern in the computer gaming industry, was repurposed, as his observations were appropriate to the board game industry and Avalon Hill specifically as well. He highlights two points of importance, and I will quote him at length here. Assuming that our goal is to have the largest possible base of players, our problem is twofold. One, to get more people to enter the marketplace, and two, to get them to stay in longer. He says that the way to do that is to get people to try more than one game, and it has to be shown that games are not just for kids, but for adults as well, and it can't be over their head and so complex that they don't get it. He observed that the challenge was that the customers that are vocal with the company are the ones that are the aficionados, and they tend to demand games that are more challenging and complex. Yet they are not the majority of the potential audience, and the games supposedly marketed at the beginner are, when evaluated objectively, just too complex and involved. Interestingly, Crawford provides an insightful comparison. We have a sobering precedent to consider. Back in the 1970s, a company called SPI rejuvenated the flagging board wargame industry and sparked a boom in the business. For five years, SPI rode high with a series of impressive designs. One of SPI's secret weapons was its feedback survey. The principals at SPI paid close attention to those survey cards, and as a result, the SPI games grew progressively bigger, more complex, and more obscure. Introductory level games grew rarer, and the game rules manuals became longer and longer. Unsurprisingly, SPI began a long downhill slide, finally collapsing in 1981. The board war games industry didn't die, but it never regained the luster of its heyday in the mid-70s. There were many reasons for the decline, of course, but catering to the aficionados was one of them. There are those at Avalon Hill that obviously knew this to be the reality they were up against. How would they respond? And what would the future hold for the company? Sadly, we now know that the game company that launched the wargaming hobby was within a few years of its total collapse, which we will examine next time in the final chapter of this series. This is Legendary Tactics.